Uh, we are welcome you again, Mr. Peter Akari at Powers. Welcome, and uh, also Fateh, welcome at Powers for this series of webinars. And uh, we all welcome uh, students who are with us here. We have around 15 students in the room, and others, they are going to join us online. So we are all here for the webinar series organized by uh, the Community of Practice of Powers, the COP, and uh, also the, the, the Young Earth, uh, the, the young Earth scienti System Scientists, YES community. And uh, these webinars, they will be running from December to March. So the, they are divided in three big thematics. The first one is sustainable development and climate change in Africa. The second one is securing nature's resources while facing extreme poverty events and the impact of climate change. And the third and last one will be the roles of early career scientists for African sustainable development. So without taking too much time, I will let Fatem to introduce the speaker of today and also the topic of today. Thank you very much. For people who do not I know am me, Fatem Atik Bahar, Executive Committee member of the Young Earth System Scientist, Yes Community, and also I am a Food, Water, Energy, Nexus, Knowledge Action Network, a Steering Committee of Future Earth. I would like to thank you all for being here and to join this first edition of the webinar series on sustainable development in Africa, the role of science, social engagement, and shaping the future of the continent. As introduced by Jean Vier, uh, this webinar series is a joint initiative and work, uh, and um, it's built from some ideas come to the Young Earth System Scientist Yes Committee and the Pan African University Institute of uh, Water and Energy Science to the contribution of Future Earth, Food, Water, Energy, Nexus, and the United Nations University. The first talk will be about the sustainable development in Africa, given practical and modern development approaches, integrating key issues uh, with emphasis on water, energy, and food security. Mr. Peter Akari is a professional civil engineer with over than 30 years work experience in conception, development, operation, management, and infrastructure scheme. Uh, he is the founder of Pakari Associate Limited in Accra, Ghana, and former chief policy officer at the African Development Bank. Um, Mr. Peter's competence includes the infrastructure policies, strategy development, uh, project development and, man and management. Uh, we are very glad to have you here, Mr. Peter, today, and honored to listen to your first talk. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Fatin, uh, for that uh, brilliant introduction. Uh, I believe that um, you know my talk would be mostly uh, very introductory. In 30 minutes, you can't do justice to a very huge subject of this nature. And so I was hoping that there will be others who would uh, take off from where you know I have left off and delve uh, into certain specific subjects. But from what I understand, these additional subjects you know and topics will be happening later in later webinars. Uh, and so you know my uh, talk would just raise you know, issues and ideas, hoping that during the discussions we can delve deeper, you know, into these uh, ideas that I'll be postulating, you know, uh, in this presentation. I believe I can continue. Um, yes, please. Yes, please, so you can proceed. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so what I want to do is that, uh, you know, with this presentation, 
uh, the table of content is uh, very short. We'll discuss briefly what we, we mean by sustainable development. We will look at the uh, frameworks, the broad frameworks for sustainable development, particularly in Africa. Uh, I will introduce some uh, pathways, which I will call integrated pathways to sustainable development. Uh, we will discuss the nexus, which I believe is a key you know, sustainable development in Africa. And then we'll look at specific examples in Africa, you know, what you can term, you know, some African success stories. Um, sustainable development is uh, a systems approach to growth and development. Uh, and in this particular approach, the idea is to manage uh, natural resources, produce resources, social capital for the welfare of the present and future generation. This is from the point of view of the principles of uh, social justice. The official definition that was given by the Brandtland Commission is that sustainable development uh, is development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, and consequently, you know, sustainable development looks at the present needs, you know, of the present generation, and then uh, development is conducted in such a way that the natural resources and ecosystems are preserved for the future generations also. Uh, what do we desire? What are what, do we, what are we looking out for in terms of sustainable development? What are the main outcomes that we expect from sustainable development? We are expecting to have clean air and water, fertile soils that produce good food, a livelihood and a healthy economy, an optimum population size, safety from poverty and disease, social connections and a sense of community, work, rest and recreation, opportunities to learn and to plow back this learning, last but not the least, to halt global warming. These are the outcomes we expect from sustainable development. Now, what are the frameworks under which we can begin to conduct sustainable development in Africa. There are some high-level frameworks that have been developed by Africa and by the world community, which form some kind of a platform that we can launch sustainable development for Africa. The African Union adopted the Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, in 2015 as the strategic framework for the economic and social transformation of Africa over the next 50 years. A couple of months later, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as the universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Uh, for Africa, we have these two blueprints, but there is nothing to worry about because they fit very much into each other. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals fit neatly into the 20 goals of the Agenda 2063. The Agenda 2063 is even much broader in scope, covering social, economic, and sustainable considerations in a broad context as well as political, cultural, and other African priorities. Consequently, by implementing Agenda 2063, uh, the African Union member states will 
ipso facto be meeting global obligations as well. Consequently, African countries are being implored to try to, uh, to implement their, their, their Agenda 2063, uh, knowing that in the end, you know, the sustainable development goals will also be achieved in that, in, in that wise. Um, the emphasis, you know, in my presentation uh, will be uh, environmental and natural resources management uh, that will produce most of the goods and services and the livelihoods we need today and to sustain that for tomorrow. The principal sources of development in Africa comprise land with the soils, the forests, you know, the fisheries inside the waters, water resources, and biomass fuel. These provide the income, social protection, employment creation for the most of the African population, including the vulnerable in society. Uh, the UNDP postulated that unsustainable use of natural resources and climate change are undermining socioeconomic benefits in Africa, as well as the environment itself, and are costing Africa up to 22% of the total annual GDP. So investing in environmental and natural resources sustainability yields very high returns, social and economic, you know, for the community and for the countries of Africa. Uh, the um, main idea being postulated in this presentation is to pursue what I would call integrated approaches to sustainable development. Uh, what are the pillars of sustainable development? It's social development, environmental protection, and economic development. And these are inextricably intertwined. And therefore, in order to be able to progress in development, you need to look at all these three as one and the same. Uh, and under the integrated approach uh, towards implementing the frameworks that we have for Africa, in particular the Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, the idea is that you break down institutions you know, the silos that institutions have created among themselves. You know, we have agriculture, we've got energy, you know, we have uh, water, we have trade. You know, these, all these institutions and all these, uh, you know, ministries and governmental agencies try to work in silos and that undermines sustainable development because these pillars are in the inextricably linked. The next postulate is that there should be involvement and empowerment of children, of women and men, you know, in the development space. The idea is also to look for new finances and to try to monitor progress of development. Uh, what am I trying to say? What I'm saying is that, for example, the ministries of finance, Sometimes planning is attached, and the ministries of the environment should be able to uh, reciprocally mainstream each other's priorities, their plans, and then in their budget. Meanwhile, the sector ministries should also be able to be responsible for integrating poverty, environmental objectives, climate change within their various sectors. Uh, what I'm trying to postulate is that the integrated approach to development is the most viable pathway to accelerate achieving the sustainable development goals and the goals of our agenda 2063. Government planning and budgeting processes as well as government staff should be enabled to better manage the three interconnected dimensions of sustainable development 
through the application of integrated tools and approaches. Burkina Faso has tried this particular approach where they have an office in the office of the president charged with trying to forge integration, with trying to forge sharing of ideas, trying to forge prioritization of development that embodies and with the involvement of everybody. And it appears to be working very well. It's not an impossible task to integrate development. Um, if you look at uh, the developmental uh, objectives that we have, what you can, an example is that land degradation, for example, erosion and loss of uh, you know, fertility, as well as climate change, which respond to the various you know, sustainable development goals and agenda 2063 goals, uh, it reduces agricultural productivity and make it harder to achieve food security and poverty reduction goals. So these are different goals, but you can see that one particular issue affects all three you know, goals. That's why there's a need to look at whatever developmental pathways we have holistically. Uh, I would want to postulate that social inclusion, sustainable land management, and climate smart practices for example, reinforces agricultural productivity goals. These are some of the examples that I want to give uh, under two main uh, dichotomous uh, divisions. What is termed the vicious cycles of degradation in Malawi, uh, deforestation causes annual loss of soils almost about 45% and reduces productivity by 6% per annum. However, if measures are taken to reduce soil erosion, if this was done as far back as 2005, by 2015, uh, the productivity would have uplifted 1.8 million Malawians out of poverty. The other case in point that I want to bring up is that in Uganda, Malawi, and Tanzania, it has been found out that women-headed farms are about 20% less productive than farms headed by men. Consequently, if women are empowered to have the resources that the men have, then women farmers can increase productivity by about 4.5%. And this can enhance food security a lot. In Mali, where irrigation is used to produce so much rice, uh, the use of energy is so inefficient. Fertilizer is so inefficiently used. Pesticides are thrown all over the place. And this is costing the country about $100 million annually. Now, if you shift to more responsible practices in rice production, increasing energy efficiency, and using you know, fertilizers and pesticides more responsibly. For every additional investment you make in sustainable practices, you gain $2.4. This was, uh, and this study was undertaken by the United Nations, UNDP, and the UNEP. Now, the nexus, the water, energy, and food nexus can be termed an integrated approach where the development of these three sectors are intertwined and they reinforce each other. Uh, I'm sure that most people who are already aware of the nexus and how each of these sectors reinforces each other. Uh, for example, uh, I know of um, a dam in uh, northern Nigeria that supplies uh, water to the city of Kano and some irrigation. Now, this river called the Komadugu River on which this dam is, has been built 
flows all the way from Kano in northern Nigeria all the way through to the Chad. Now, the construction of this dam has disseminated the Nguru wetlands, which is very close to the Jigawa state. Now, how can dam management be made in such a way that you know the wetlands can be revived, wetlands can be maintained, while reaping the benefits of the construction of the dam? You know, so you can see the dam construction has affected the natural resources, which then reduces productivity because wetlands, you know, provide so much livelihood to a lot of people. So food production, uh, the construction of dams to provide energy and for irrigation purposes, you know, are intertwined. Similarly, water supply is also kind of affected. Now, what uh, the Nexus is saying is that because the demand for water and energy resources and food is going to increase you know, over the next uh, decades due to increasing population, urbanization, consumer habits, people are beginning to eat more meat and so on. Uh, it poses serious challenges to Africa. And it is necessary to address the water, energy and food issues jointly because these choices and actions are in this domain affect each other, positively or negatively. For example, limited access to energy and water can reduce food security. While water is needed for energy regeneration, uh, as in uh, hydropower or cooling water for thermal plants, uh, meanwhile energy is also needed to extract water, distribute water and treat water supply. Uh, so, if you look at the integrative nature of implementing water, agriculture, and energy, you would understand why it is important that we look at this whole thing holistically. Now, African countries have already started pursuing sustainable development paradigms. In Ethiopia, they have just completed a major thermal plant they call it the rapid thermal plant, which converts waste to energy. And it treats 1,400 tons of waste per day. For those of you who know Addis Ababa, there used to be heaps and heaps of mountains of refuse. Uh, now, this is a thing of the past, because the refuse is systematically collected and fed to this thermal plant. Now, uh, and 80% of Addis Ababa's waste is now converted to electricity for 3 million people. So consequently, this plant does not just clean up the environment and preventing pollution and diseases due to, you know, water and excretor related diseases, but provides the much needed energy for the city of Addis Ababa. Uh, in Morocco, uh, they are leading as far as solar energy resources are concerned in Africa. Currently, 32% of its energy requirements comes from renewable resources. They hope to achieve 44% by 2020. It, Morocco is currently investing about $9 billion in a huge solar-powered farm in an area they call the Dra Tafila Let region. And this is expected to produce electricity for over one million homes by the end of this year. Now, Morocco's success story in solar energy development, Ethiopia's uh, thermal plant may very well encourage other African countries to pay attention to sustainable practices since their successes. In conclusion, what I want to be able to put across for us all to discuss is that achieving the SDGs and the Agenda 2063 goals in Africa will require effective and diverse coalitions of various governmental institutions, civil society, the private sector institutions, the various communities, 
and the public at large working together harmoniously and with strong leadership. The Agenda 2063 and the SDGs call on all governments to ensure that economic development is inclusive, improves the well-being for the various status of society, boys and girls, women and men, in a sustained way and within environmental limits. Now, some African countries have taken the lead and are already implementing sustainable development initiatives. And the gains, these important gains towards sustainable development, you know, open the way for Afri other African countries to follow suit. And that within a very short time, hopefully, many countries will emulate the examples of Ethiopia and Morocco and several other countries. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation and I'm available for the discussions. So can my, my micro was m muted. So uh, I would say thank you very much, Mr. Peter, for your bright presentation. And uh, I would ask if we can have the questions now and start the discussion part of this webinar. I think that Mudathir have a question. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With that here, please can you ask your question to Mr. Peter and to the whole attendee of this webinar? Okay, the moderator question is in the slide six. You, he, uh, he said that you mentioned halting global warming could global warming bring some advantages to Africa? What are those advantages? Yes, I've, I've had a question. Uh, she's asking whether there are any advantages to global warming. Well, there are some, uh, I've heard of uh, certain advantages. I've heard that uh, in the Sahel, uh, where they have uh, you know, had uh, very long droughts. Uh, certain places that haven't seen rain for, you know, so many years have started getting some rain. And that is very, very surprising. Uh, that could be some advantage in that part of Africa. But by and large, we know of only the disadvantages of global warming. That is, the droughts are going to be longer, the floods are going to recur, and they are going to be haphazard, uh, infrequent. It's not going to be possible to predict the weather. 
And you know, agriculture, for example, depends on the cycle of rainfall and dry seasons. And if it's going to be difficult, you know, to predict when the rains will come or when the drought will end, then of course, you know, it's going to be very difficult to institute agriculture. So there may be some isolated advantages for certain communities, but by and large, the disadvantages outweigh these advantages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for your response, uh, Mr. Peter. Uh, are there any other questions? Please. Okay, uh, Mudathir has another question. He said that in slide 11, does the land degradation bring climate change or climate change bring the land degradation? Shall I repeat the question, Mr. Peter, or is it fine? Yes. yes okay. Yes, I can, I can read it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was on the slide 11. The question is, does land degradation bring climate change or climate change brings light, uh, land degradation? Well, this question is like the chicken and the egg. Which, which comes first? <laughs> the... <laughs> The answer is that they actually reinforce each other. However, most land degradation in Africa is caused by slash and burn and improper agricultural practices. Uh, the forests, in an attempt to increase in agricultural production, the forests are slashed down and bent, and then there's cultivation. Opening up these forests causes erosion uh, it depletes the soil nutrients and then what, what happens is that because some of the cultural practices are not efficient, the land loses its fertility, you know, and therefore they will abandon that land because it has lost fertility and no longer produces and go and slash again and burn, hoping that the new land would have better resources for them to be able to do agriculture. So in Africa, most of the, uh, the land degradation is actually caused by poor cultural practices in agriculture. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Peter, for answering this question as well. Um, I have another question from Mr. Anuru. He said, thank you very much for your presentation and I'm very glad to join this webinar. My question is from the first conclusion, how about initiating African climate party like the one of the IPCC uh, and where such an issue will be propagated? Then Rinkin. Yes, uh, Africa, Africa definitely is part of the IPCC and African issues are discussed thoroughly and study thoroughly. Uh, what we can have in Africa is probably a platform for you know the African situation where we can bring up ideas, we can exchange ideas on how best to tackle climate change. Uh, but as far as the the science is concerned, the science of climate, the research that goes on, you know, the vulnerabilities and so on, uh, this is thoroughly discussed at the IPCC level, and Africa does not need to have its, you know, its equivalent. You know, the Africans just need to be able to discuss among themselves and to coordinate action on the ground, and that currently is done at the level of the African Union uh, through the various uh, programs that African Union has. African Union has the CADEP, which you know, it reinforces agricultural production. The African Union has the NEPAD, you know, which looks at natural resources in general and development, water resources, and so on. And these are the platforms under which, you know, the individual actions take place. Uh, but to have a separate, you know, council in Africa, well, it could, it could start with the African Union, but I wonder 
whether we would get the support you know of uh, the member states to be able to set up another council you know africa has been cited as an, in a, con a continent that has so many institutions that do not bite you know so if, can we really can't we use the existing institutions to be able to dialogue you know on climate rather than setting up a new institution these are my views but other views are also welcome yeah i, I would ask if there are any um yeah of, for these questions uh, some initiative on on bringing this together or some discussion with the african union or something like this i remember last time i was on the internet and i saw some platform built by the african development team uh bank i mean and that was uh, mainly uh, uh yeah that was mainly a platform to collect data so uh are there any um ideas to to develop this and uh to make it more um to, to bring actions and to initiate activities or something like this? I, I suppose so. Uh, in view of the fact that Africa hasn't got such a platform for in continuous interaction and exchange of ideas, you realize that each time there is um, you know, a climate meeting, then that is when they come together to try to adopt a common position. Uh, you know, like Kyoto, you know, the African Development Bank organized Africa, you know, for Kyoto. You know, I remember the Paris meetings were also orchestrated. Africans, you know, then dialogued among themselves as to what positions to take and so on. So uh, it is important to have, you know, an institution in Africa that is devoted, you know, and discusses very thoroughly uh, issues of climate change uh, and not just wait until when there are big meetings and then we scramble to try to co come together. Uh, but what my point is that we don't need to set up an, institu an institute or an institution, a separate institution, there are existing institutions that can take the lead uh, in, this, in these discussions. Uh, and uh, the African Union can definitely, you know, collab you know, collaborate with the countries to be able to come up with the appropriate institution to house climate change. Uh, but as I said, there is the CADE process, there is uh, there's the NEPAD process that is ongoing. Uh, there are other institutions, there is the African Minister's Council on Water, the African Minister's Council on Energy, you know, and so on. Uh, and therefore, it's possible to house such a discussion group in any of the existing uh, institutions. Ideas are welcome from everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for responding to this question. And I, I have also another question related to this one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I started to ask a lot of questions here. Um, my question is more um, how, how with the presence of the young generation, the youth, the early career scientists with these uh, initiatives, discussions, ideas. Uh, are there something that uh, are bringing the, the vision or the idea of the, of the youth in the continent about this? Um, you know, uh, Africa is the, the continent when they are, um, where it is most uh, led from young generation and uh, yeah, this is always a question that came to my mind when we discuss the sustainability, the, um, the frameworks, and the initiatives. Yes, of course, there is always room for the involvement of the youth, you know, the scientists in particular, in other words, uh, youth that have taken you know, science and, develop, and development, you know, as their career. Uh, there are always, uh, you know, initiatives that accompany most of the African processes. I remember that uh, for each uh, African Water Week, where the African Minister's Council organizes, you know, 
all countries to come and discuss issues of water, there is always a forum for you know, young people, always. And they are encouraged to come and listen, to present, to discuss you know, issues, particularly issues affecting the youth and the development of water. Similarly, the Energy Forum also has a similar you know, uh, practice of involving the youth each time that they are meeting. Uh, but I can see that there should be a lot more concerted effort, you know, to bring in the youth in, in the development, uh, you know, space and the dialogue that we have on questions of development. Uh, I can see that YES is very active. So YES, for example, could take up, you know, issues with all these forums that we have. The African Ministers Council Forum, the African Energy Forum, you know, the NEPAD process, and so on, actively seek to engage, you know, these particular forums, you know, uh, and not just wait for you to be invited. Sometimes it's, it's important to initiate yourself, you know, ask for space, you know, to be able to discuss questions related to you know, the development of science and technology in development. Uh, so that in the end, it's not just coming from one side, it's not these forums inviting the youth, but the youth are also getting themselves, you know, invited and getting involved. And I'm sure that all these programs that are being initiated by YES and some of these other youth forums uh, would eventually yield fruit. You know, you have to keep on, you have to keep it up, a lot of pressure, don't relent. It is not easy, but you have to be concerted in your approach towards get, getting a voice in all these forums that we have in Africa on development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Peter, for answering my question. And of course, you are in yes, um, very open and also very uh, motivated to to go through this discussion and to contribute to shaping the future of our continent. And we have the East Africa team who is very active with the initiatives and the activities. Uh, I think from the uh, student side, there are some questions that uh, Janvier will uh, moderate. So uh, please, Janvier, the floor is yours. Thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, I'd like to ask. food than the men-led funds. So I'd like to know, like, uh, what limits women to produce le uh, more food than men, like, if? Did you? Yes, okay. Your voice was breaking, but I, if I get the gist of it, why is it that product agricultural productivity uh, is greater, you know, for men-headed uh, farmers than women-headed farmers. Is that a question? Yes, that is it. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, it's uh, it's quite easy. Uh, in agricultural production, there are inputs. You need to prepare the land. You need inputs. You need seeds. You need fertilizer. You need uh, weedicide. You know, you need, you know, uh, technology, you know, equipment to be able to manage the farms. Uh, and then by and large, you realize that, you know, because men have access to, you know, resources, you know, they are able to have all these inputs ahead of the women, you know, and that, 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 that is why. So what is happening is that, for example, in IFAD, Actually, I'm sitting in the IFAD office right now. Uh, what they do is that they then try as much as possible to make the inputs available to the women. Uh, it, it's not for free, but whenever they then harvest, they are able to pay back these inputs. The men have more resources. That is how come the productivity is greater. Did you get it? Okay, uh, I, I was saying this before before our mark was off, but I was saying that we are going to take a round of questions for time management. So uh, we are going to take like a, 
you have a question yes you you ask the question and then you that's all uh, so we have two questions from students yeah, come on okay thank you very much mr akari for the presentation um i have two questions um the first one is about uh, you mentioned about three factors that are affecting uh, the sustainable development being environmental uh, social and then uh, economic. Uh, so I would like to get it clear uh, how exactly social uh, issues and economic issues uh, affect the sustainable development in Africa. Then the other question is about um, the water food nexus, water energy and food nexus. I would also like to know if uh, we have um, initiatives, practical initiatives in place that can help us uh, make this nexus a reality. Thank you. So let's take the last question for another student. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. My question is centered on uh, the global environment that we are in, looking at globalization. The United States of America has been at the forehead of funding most of the climate uh, change agendas, but at the moment with the current president, he has decided not to be involved in the climate change issues. So is it sustainable in the coming future for African countries or even other world powers to be adopting to climate issues or to be concentrated mainly in mitigation in light of uh, how the global environment is at the moment. Thank you. So yes, you, uh, those are the questions. Yeah, this, yeah these, are, these are the two questions. So, okay, that's fine. Uh, the first question is on the, uh, the three elements of uh, sustainable development and how social aspects and economic aspects affect sustainable development. I take the social aspects first. Uh, we discussed extensively, you know, for example, the role of, of women uh, and how women are sort of disadvantaged, you know, when it comes to uh, issues of uh, their livelihoods, uh, partly because they don't have land tenure, for example, when it comes to agriculture they are kind of marginalized when it comes to with issues of uh, you know resources you know they are given the waste land you know and so on uh, so you find out that you know women uh, you know headed households for example are so much disadvantaged that their offspring their children and they are everybody that depends on them are very much disadvantaged, you know, so that when it comes to development, uh, they are unable to come up to their full potential because of the social situation in which they are. You know, so eventually, this affects, uh, you know, the contribution of, of, of women on one hand. And then in Africa, uh, the contribution of, you know, young people, you know, maybe young adults from the age of, say, 15 to 24, and then from, say, 25 to 35, you know, their views, for example, as far as development is concerned, you know, it's not very much taken. You know, you have to be an adult, you have to be a house head before you can take part in major discussions, you know, affecting the community. You know, whereas, you know, as young as they are, if they took part in discussions, they can bring in their widow's might and contribute and then because they will then become the future leaders they are better able to contribute you know to society but their views are neglected so the social structure makes it in such a way that uh, certain segments of society are disadvantaged and do not are not able to contribute to their full potential and this affects development I mean, as far as the, uh, the economy is concerned, when you have, of course, an economy that is weak, uh, 
you know, within the world stage, there is so much that you need to be able to, you know, to foster development. Uh, you need foreign exchange. You need resources that are, you know, bit better managed. But then if the economy is weak, of course, it's going to be very difficult for you to acquire all the inputs that you need for your development. And therefore, it, in the end, it affects overall development in the country. Uh, so the economic situation affects development in general. The social structure, you know, the place of women in particular, and young people affects economic development. So the idea is that any time that uh, there is development discussions, any time that there is a framework for implementing developmental issues, the idea is to include as much as possible, empower as much as possible all segments of the society so that everybody brings, you know, is able to contribute to their full potential the benefit of the whole society. Uh, there was another question on the water nexus, and I think that uh, you are asking whether there are other, you know, practical steps towards enforcing this water nexus. So that is the import of my presentation. My presentation is about the fact that it is important. It's extremely important to work together and not work in silos. It's important to break down institutional barriers to development in general, and more so the water, energy, and food nexus. That, you know, institutions, ministries, governmental institutions, for example, that deal with these should not work in isolation. They need to be coordinated. They need, you know, uh, to be kind of, uh, there should be a forum that all these institutions are kind of coordinated to embed and to include all the aspects of uh, sustainable development, how they can reinforce each other, you know, and so on. So when a dam is being built, for example, you know, for hydropower, you need to have not just the energy people, but you need agriculture people, you know, you need the water supply and sanitation people. So in the end, you optimize the investment that you are going to make, you know, in this dam. So that is what, you know, my whole presentation is about. It's about finding ways, what we call integrative approaches, you know, towards development in general. You know, I mentioned that in Burkina Faso, this is already happening. You know, uh, there's no one single step that I can just come up with a project and start implementing it. It needs to fit in within the overall requirements of all the other sectors. So those are the practical steps I can think of. And uh, now, with regards to the uh, the withdrawal of the United States of America from climate discussions, from the climate uh, agenda of the world, and how that can affect Africa. Yes, the U.S. has contributed so much. Uh, but then with the change of government, of course, officially, they say they are withdrawing. But we have been assured you know, by the American community that it's just the uh, the office of the president that is against this particular idea and that the states, and I talk in particular for the state of California and New York, the biggest states in the United States of America, have continued to back all the global efforts in climate change on their own. The states have their resources and they contribute. And therefore, although there would be some loss of, you know, funding from the federal government, but other sources of funding that used to come from the U.S. is still coming because the majority of the United States of America believes in climate change. The denial of climate change is just at the presidency and they do not really make up America. So we should have no fears. The support will continue to come. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Akari, for the answers. So I'm, I will give the floor to Fateh before ending the webinar. Thank you very much.
much, Jean-Vier. Thank you very much, Mr. Peter. Uh, maybe before giving the floor to Jean-Vier to conclude on this uh, first webinar, I have like two questions. I forget to ask you them when, uh, when we start the discussion. Uh, yeah, the question one is, uh, through your experience as a former chief policy officer at the African Development Bank, I would like to ask how far are we in implementing the frameworks documentation that underpin African future development? And the second one is um, now while facing the extreme events, mainly if we consider some examples of heavy extreme events happening during the last 20 years, uh, the climate change effect as well. How is the situation on the whole continent to put the strategies and framework uh, together and, uh, and make some concrete actions uh, that can shape uh, the continent and ensure the nexus? Uh, yeah, and what are mainly the best practices? And we, when we talk about this, is it more about investment frameworks strategies, the wheeling, initiating, uh, I mean, activities, actions. Yeah, and those are my two questions. The Development Bank uh, has got, uh, has developed, uh, you know, its own uh, strategy towards supporting the, the, the African agenda. And their framework is on five pillars. There are five pillars that underpin the African Development Bank support uh, to Africa. The first one is on food. They call it the, the Feed Africa program. In other words, boosting agricultural production uh, is the number one of their pillar. The second one is called Energize Africa. They want Africa to be lighted and that every African country should have literally 100% uh, connection to electricity. That is the second uh, pillar. Uh, the third one uh, concerns what they call uh, uh, social and economic development, the societal that is human development with regards to health, education, you know, access to water supply, you know, these come together, you know, to form what you call the social, socioeconomic aspects of, of development. So they have all these uh, strategic pillars that they have developed, which have been reliably informed, uh, were all accepted by the African Union, and they have now been mainstreamed into the Agenda 2063. And so they are monitored uh, under the Agenda 2063 by the African Union, taking into consideration the contribution of the African Development Bank under their five pillars, which they call the high fives. Uh, so that is what the African Development Bank is doing, and it, it's not being done on their own. They partner with all the countries, and the African Union is overseeing whatever that is going on to ensure that Africa reaps the most benefit from the contribution of the African Development Bank. Uh, your other question you talk about extreme events uh, in Africa. By extreme events, we are talking about droughts and floods, essentially, since we don't have that much of earthquakes and, you know, and so on. Uh, and what is being done, this is being tackled, you know, multi-pronged. And it's not just the African Development Bank through their programs, but uh, this is being tackled by all the other bodies. You know, uh, you've got the uh, 
African Minister's Council on Energy uh, bring in their contributions from the energy point. They collaborate very much with the African Minister's Council on water uh, because water is the end result of all these uh, extremes. Either there's such a sheer shortage or there is too much of it. Uh, so they talk together, they dialogue with each other. And then you've got the agricultural aspect, which is called the CADEP. Uh, the CADEP is actually being coordinated by the Nepal Secretariat and the African Union. You know, so all these two people come together to try as much as possible to mitigate the effects of extreme events in Africa. Uh, they break it down, of course, into the continental level. The subcontinents have got their sub, you know, committees that look at these. For example, AMCAO has got five sub-regions, you know, with various committees looking at the region-specific cases, because the case in Central Africa is not the same as the case in Southern Africa. Uh, similarly, the African Minister's Council on Energy is also divided into five sub-regions, and they tackle the issues at the regional level. Uh, so, so far, these are some of the initiatives I know that try as much as possible to work together towards mitigating extreme events in Africa and supporting each other to be able to come up with solutions towards extreme events in Africa. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, so I think that's Fate, do you have something more to add? Uh, I just want to thank you very much for uh, answer our question and give us this nice talk on the sustainable development in Africa, Mr. Peter, and also for you, Jean Vier, for coordinating from the PAO side and to all the organizing team to make uh, this, this event succeed. And uh, I think that I will give you the floor to conclude and um, yeah, just go ahead, Jean Vier. Thank you very much. So uh, <clears throat> I'm very glad that uh, we did it, the first one. And uh, as I said before, is a series of webinar. We congratulations. So we thank you all, all of you guys who are here present, and try to mobilize your followers, student members, also to join for the coming webinars. And uh, I really thank uh, Mr. Axel from the staff of Powers who allow us to have the technical, all the technical set up. I thank you also the YES team that made this webinar to be a reality. And uh, I will end up by presenting myself because I did not do it before. My name is Jamje Kamundala and uh, I'm the overall COP leader of Powers. So thank you very much and I think that we will see again on the next webinar. Thank you very much, Jean Bye bye. Thank you bye. very much, Mr. Peter. That was really a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. My pleasure. The pleasure is mine. Thanks for the opportunity.